Working in an Australian CRO, we're always discussing the advantages of running clinical trials in Australia. Today I've got an R&D tax specialist, Adam Rogers of Swanson Reed. Adam helps companies come from the US to Australia to run to set up and uh, be eligible for R&D tax incentive. Tell us a bit about it. I understand that it's a 43.5% cashback, is that correct? That's correct, Luke. It's a 43.5% cashback, one of the best incentives in the world for international companies to invest into Australia, right? And we're talking about 43.5%, which translates to about for every $100,000 of expenditure, you will get $43,500 cash back from the government if you meet certain circumstances. The US, their R&D credit is uh, very, very small compared to some of the other countries in the world. In the US, we're looking at 6% as opposed to countries like Australia that is offering up to 43.5%. Investing in, in countries like Australia does help the bottom line and should be part of any board strategy to diversify those studies. Um, I know that there's a really good link which we'll put at the bottom of the screen um, to do with, uh, and I know it's on your, on your blog which is always really well up to date. Um, if you ever want to check it out, go and check out his blog uh, on Swanson Reid. Uh, there's a really nice table to explain the different countries' uh, uh, R&D incentives and, and what you get from different countries. Uh, okay, tell us a bit more about eligibility. What, what, are, what, are, what are American companies, or even Australian companies for that matter, what sort of eligibility do they need to fit to be eligible for this cashback? Right, so, so for companies to meet the requirements, they're, they're quite strict. But normally companies within the biotech sphere meet that very, very easily. Uh, phase one, phase two, phase three clinical trials will, will most definitely meet those rules. But, but basically it's split up into three major tests. We, we need to be conducting what they call experimental activities. Right. It needs to have a, a permitted purpose of generating new knowledge, which, which phase one to phase three clinical trials does. We're generating new information. Uh, we need to know what the activity is and whether or not it can be determined in advance based on current information uh, and uh, it needs to have a hypothesis and uh, an experimental purpose and proceed from that experiment to observation, evaluation and lead to a logical conclusion. So they may be all scary words but, but in, a, in a standard clinical trial you're, 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 you're determining new information, new knowledge every single, every single day. Tell me a bit about eligibility in terms of turnover. I, I understood at one point that companies had to have under $20 million turnover. Correct, and that's exactly the, the same rules as it's always been. The, uh, the global turnover of the company must be less than $20 million Australian dollars. That's Australian to, dollars, to, okay. Exactly, so US dollars we're looking at about $15 million at, at the exact uh, that's 75 cents in the dollar exchange rate, correct, as of 2017. Awesome. And so companies that are running clinical trials in Australia, they, they have to have a, a local legal entity in Australia. Tell us a bit about bringing companies from uh, the States particularly to Australia in order to run clinical trials. Correct, okay. So Australia is all about spillover benefits. The, the, this incentive is not for free. You must set up a company in Australia, ideally a subsidiary of the US parent, and conduct the R&D in that Australian entity. So hiring staff, employees, engage contractors, otherwise conduct the R&D on Australian soil. Yeah. Now I understand Australia is one of the easiest countries to set up a, a company in probably the world. Uh, can you take us through those that process a little bit more? Well, I mean, there is there is red tape in Australia. I don't want to discount that, but but in terms of efficiency, Australia is one of the the most efficient countries in the world for getting through those those regulations and barriers. So, so by the time we 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 have a US company that wants to invest in Australia and and they're ready to go, we, we usually can set up a entity in Australia within 48 hours. 48 hours, it's pretty impressive. Now, in, in our experience, I think that it's important that companies consider this concept before they start rather than try to uh, do things retrospectively. Mm -hmm. Now, would you say the same? Absolutely. In fact, given the fact that we must 
establish an Australian entity, we must have a prospective look. So, so for example, and I get this all the time, that a US company will uh, intend to do research and development offshore, and in this case, Australia. We'll look at that as a jurisdiction. We will need to, to have a couple of weeks to set up the entity, set up the bank accounts, uh, otherwise get through the regulatory red tape to, to engage those contractors, and uh, engage employees and, and, and start the R&D activity. You're then waiting and now a 12 month window or at least until the end of the Australian tax year which will be June 30 for you then to make uh, a claim to the Australian government, in this case the Australian tax office, for that refund. And in that case, you could be looking at perhaps three months after that to get that refund. So yes, you must have a prospective outlook. So we like to think that there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of great choice for companies coming from the states in terms of CRO service providers. We're not the only one. Um, there's a lot to choose from. Uh, when you are choosing a CRO in Australia, it's it's important to uh, also consider. Um, a provider that is a reg what you call an RSP or a registered service provider with Oz Industry, which we are, we happen to be. Um, if there are other CROs that aren't, it's 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 crazy because um, I believe it makes the R and D tax incentive claim a lot more straightforward. Do you want to tell us a bit about that? RSPs, registered research service providers, uh, have a certain level of uh, of experience. With the Australian government, they they uh, they meet a certain standard of um, of research, whether it be national or benchmarked to international standards. So, so the Australian government does prefer to have research that is conducted by an RSP for that reason. So it's not a hundred percent requirement, but it no, can make not. the process a bit more straightforward. Um, is that right? Correct. Yeah. Correct. So, so, so an RSP would would need to meet certain requirements that also meet the requirements of an R&D tax incentive, and and so if you are uh, engaging in Australia for the first time and 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 you you lack experience in, in in the way of business in Australia, dealing with an RSP will will make the process much easier because because that RSP has knowledge about the R&D incentive and the certain research standard that the Australian government requires. If you'd like to learn a bit more about Oz Industry, uh, the RSP service provider list, um, Swanson Reed, Adam Rogers, uh, CROs such as Data Farm Australia, uh, running clinical trials in Australia, don't hesitate to get in contact. Uh, we'll have links at the bottom and uh, we look forward to hearing the questions that may come across because we obviously haven't covered everything here today, but it's it's, it's a start of the conversation.